All right, it's been a couple days now, and I'm going to share some of my thoughts on this latest school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Now, for those of you who have been longtime subscribers, you know that gun control was kind of like the first issue that I covered. I think the first 20 or 30 videos I made way back 10 years ago or 11 years ago at this point were all about gun control. And even more basal than that, uh, it was the first like political issue that I really looked at and got interested in. And so part of the reason for that was related to another school shooting. When I was in high school, the uh, Columbine shooting had happened. Uh, and it was very much in the news, especially in the lead up to the 2000 election between Al Gore and George Bush. And there was a lot of stuff in the media about the NRA and about gun control. Now, I wasn't raised with guns. Uh, my dad was a bow hunter, so I was raised doing archery, but not guns. We didn't have any guns in the house. Uh, and I don't believe I ever touched a gun. I think I saw my uncle shooting a gun once or twice. And it was a muzzle loader. Uh, he had been in the army and uh, was something of a gun aficionado and had a couple muzzle loaders that he would deer hunt with. And I think I saw those, but I never touched them. And I think I only saw them once or twice. And it wasn't something that was part of my life. Uh, but I looked at the issue as best as I could back then, as pre-internet days. And then that kind of became the cornerstone issue for me. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I actually started buying guns, owning guns, shooting guns. Um, but it's continued to be a rich subject. There's so many interesting things about it. Uh, there's so many facets. You can look at the legal facets. You can look at the Second Amendment. You can look at the ethical and the moral, um, you know, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, thought experiments. You can look at the history. And on top of all that, it can often be very dramatic. You can have these dramatic examples uh, where the principles get illustrated one way or another. And so whenever this happens, we get the same um, you know, take being given that we need to restrict guns, we need to ban guns. It's so far for a very long time, it just it seems to not have been working. You know, you had the 1994 Brady Bill, uh, and part of that sunsetted in 2004, and there just seems to have not been. The, the forces of gun rights have proven to be robust, powerful and organized and it's not just the NRA there's a whole plethora of organizations and they're very politically keyed in it's one of the very few issues by the way that um, has enjoys a lot of um, bipartisan support there's a lot of Democrats who are more or less pro-gun there's a section of the Democratic Party that is well there's a small section of it that's virulently anti-gun these are the Dianne Feinstein's have everyone turn them in if you could um, the Carol McCarthy's, uh, you know, those types of people. Uh, and then you have a, a broader wing that favors, uh, obviously, some restrictions, but they don't usually talk about going that far. And these are the type who say, oh, I, I value hunting, but uh, of course you can have a shotgun, but... Um, and the, But then you have a lot of Democrats who basically don't have any interest in gun control, and especially in some swing states like West Virginia, it's a big topic. So people, someone like Joe Manchin kind of needs to listen to the NRA. The NRA is going to be important to him. It's not important to everyone. Diane Feinstein doesn't need to care about the NRA, but uh, Joe Manchin does. Um, so it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. Now, looking at what happened in Uvalde, I mean, there's so many things you could talk about, and I'm not going to cover them all because there's so many. But the thing that I want to talk about first is to go all the way back to the Declaration of Independence because I think that that really drives why this is such a fundamental issue for so many people, including myself. This is the very first thing that it says, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, libertarian, most of you are libertarians. Liberty is extremely important. You know, it's, this, uh, it's something that uh, just morally and ethically seems to be, you know, the least impeachable, the best the most certain moral philosophy, not that it's perfectly certain there are problems philosophically, but there's fewer problems with libertarianism, uh, you know, a non-interventionist, uh, I mean, I don't mean that in the international sense, but in the in interpersonal sense, uh, political philosophy, right? It, the less coercion you have, the fewer hurdles there are in your political philosophy. If you have a political philosophy that includes a lot of coercion, okay, maybe, maybe that 
maybe that system has some merits, but you're going to have to come up with some pretty good arguments to justify the coercion. Because if you don't, and that co if coercion is just a general principle that's always good and not only exceptionally good in certain cases, then there's just going to be mass true anarchy. There's going to be true, like and in the pejorative sense, anarchy. There's going to be people killing each other all the time. And not only will that happen, but you won't have any leg to stand on to say that it's wrong, right? If somebody comes up and commits a bunch of murders, if you have a polit political philosophy that says coercion is, is basically fine or defines it so broadly that it's essentially practically fine for anyone to do, then you've got a lot of problems. Whereas if you have a political philosophy that tightly constrains coercion uh, uh, very strictly, then that's going to have a lot fewer problems. And there's even a debate of whether libertarianism entails no coercion at all. Let's say, for instance, that somebody has committed uh, a crime against you, property crime against you. You go to libertarian court. Libertari libertarian court has a fair trial, whatnot, and then it concludes this person did commit a crime. They owe you restitution. And so you go forward and claim your restitution. You, you take their car or take their property or whatever. Uh, you could call that coercion. People are going to debate. People are probably going to comment and say it, whether it is or not. But you could say that it is, but you could also say that it's very, very constrained. It's not a general principle. You can't generally do that. It's only in exceptional circumstances, like after a fair trial uh, and in the pursuit of reasonable sense of justice, that it would be okay. Another, another example, uh, maybe more pertinent to today's topic, would be if you are using it in self-defense, right? Now, uh, Again, people are going to debate whether that's coercion or not if you defend yourself. And there's more or less ambiguous cases. So if you're getting attacked, if you've already been shot and they're coming in for the, the final kill and you are able to stop them, that's one thing versus they haven't actually hurt you yet or they haven't actually fired the first round, but you think that they're going to. That's a steep uh, a steep um, burden of proof on you, but not one that's necessarily impossible. Uh, but suffice to say, libertarianism uh, has the least amount of coercion, I think, and, and it makes a very conscious attempt to reduce it. I think the other political philosophies often don't do that. They just are like, what what would feel good? What do we want? And then if that whatever amount of coercion is necessary to make that happen, then that's what we're comfortable with. But the principles that they use almost never make sense. You know, this is the big insight if you read. I mean, many libertarians have had this insight, but if you read the problem with political authority, uh, by Michael Humer. The, the problem, uh, specifically speaking, is that the, the principles that would make justify state coercion would justify almost all types of coercion that we would typically, uh, that most people think is wrong. So if we go back to the uh, Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit, pursuit of happiness, libertarianism is very important, but the most important thing is life. You know, and of course, other thing in the news, abortion. So that obviously comes into play there. But there's this understanding in that uh, in that sequence of, of values that without life, nothing else matters. You can't have free speech. You can't have freedom of assembly. You can't have freedom of the press. You can't have freedom of religion. You can't have any number of things. You can't have anything else uh, that's, uh, you know, corporeal uh, if you're dead. Right, whatever you want to say about the afterlife, that has no effect on your physical life uh, in the here and now, or in the foreseeable future that you continue to exist. Uh, and so, anything that kind of threatens that, or invalidates that, or takes that out of your hands, uh, is an existential threat to all other rights. Right, everything else is contingent on that one, and. What I'm not saying here, and what I don't think anybody would would argue, is that this means that at all times every single person must be personally uh, defending themselves. Everyone needs to have a bandolier and three guns and be ready to defend themselves at any moment from all comers. You can absolutely delegate, just like you don't have to be a subsistence farmer, you don't have to be a gardener, you don't have to be a hunter, you can delegate these, you can use the division of labor, the wonderful um, efficiencies that come from market capitalism and free exchange, freedom of association to have other people, you know, uh, create your food, hunt your meat, uh, uh, can it, preserve it, uh, package it and present it to you and then you can do whatever is most, uh, whatever comparative advantage you have 
to maximize your income and go and, and get those things. But, uh, and, and you can do lots of things for your defense. If you want to hire defense people, you can. If you want to be in a community that has some kind of defensive apparatus, if you want to live in a place with walls, if you want to put locks on your doors, if you want to live uh, in an isolated place and surround yourself with a moat, if you only want to travel in crowds, if you only want to avoid places where the chances of violence are excruciatingly small, those are all fine. But at the bottom line, it's your right, and it's something that you need to be able to do on your own if necessary. And that's not always necessary. I don't carry a gun with me all the time. It's pretty safe where I am. The only times I've carried guns where I was actually afraid wasn't from people. It was from bears. You know, a couple times where I went hiking, hiking where there are bears. And even then, I have to acknowledge that the uh, fear was you know, relatively exaggerated in my mind, something I knew even at the time. But it's entirely possible that you could find yourself in a situation where it would be uh, that your defense would have to devolve to yourself. And what much of the gun control debate centers on, basically, is that the state is going to come in and say, no, ultimately, it's not your life to defend. Ultimately, you can't be the one to use self-defense. Now, in the United States, there are not that many gun control advocates who will deliberately say this, but the rhetoric of what they do say often implies this. If they say things like, guns are meant to kill, nobody should have guns, I mean, that's pretty obvious. Um, the police can protect you. And if you go to places like Australia and Canada and the UK, uh, the legal right to self-defense has been eroded considerably to the point where it's almost never right. And I've been told straight up by people who identify as libertarians but live in Australia mostly uh, that there is ne it is never okay to commit self-defense, that the judicial um, constraints by which self-defense would be acceptable are um, basically so prohibitive that in practice it's never allowable. So what they're essentially saying is that you can't defend yourself ever. Now, you might be able to contract with somebody else, and the state can do it, but you can't. And those the, that, that then throws into question all of your other rights. There's a utilitarian aspect to that. Can we trust the government to protect us, which in the light of Uvalde and basically every school shooting, I might add, um, is a, a pretty sobering uh, question to ask because apparently, even if they wanted to protect you, they can't at least in any uh, meaningful way that uh, you can take seriously. Um, but then there's just the deontological question of whether you should be able to, one, the, to, be able to defend yourself. And I, I think this is so basic. I would, I would ask uh, those out there who question this, who don't believe in, in self-defense, when, when you watch a, a nature documentary and you see a pack of lions you know, attack a wildebeest or a cape buffalo or whatever other herbivore they're going after, do you, do you think that the Cape Buffalo or whatever, the animal, is obligated to simply lie down and allow the lions to kill it and consume it? Well, no, I, say, I use this example, but we could be talking about wolves, any predator. Do you think it is some kind of obligation, a duty, a duty to be a victim, as they would say in the gun control debate? Do you think these animals... Uh, you know, they can run away. I'm sure there's not many people who would object to that. But if they get cornered, if the predators are able to you know, cap, uh, capture them or get up, uh, um, close the distance and, and close ranks with them, are these herbivores, these prey items that are about to be slaughtered in the most horrific way, are they allowed to defend themselves? You know, and, and it's clear that evolutionarily speaking, they've been equipped to this to more or less degree. I mean, they've got horns, they've got hooves, hooves. a lot of them have this aggression, some of them are big and powerful. And when you watch, you know, Cape Buffalo gore a lion, do you think this is wrong and that the buffalo should simply allow itself to be killed? Um, you know, does, can you ever imagine David Attenborough narr narrating a nature documentary where, you know, he outlines that philosophy where the prey items are obligated to be victims that if they fail to escape, then they must submit. And I don't know anyone who would believe that, but if you're saying that you can't defend yourself uh, at all, or let alone with a gun, and practically speaking, being the most effective means available to both criminals and uh, individuals, uh, saying somebody can't use a gun or can't have a gun for self-defense, 
is uh, to a very large extent making them defenseless in certain situations. Not in every situation, but in certain situations. If you're getting deliberately targeted, deliberately attacked, um, you know the fact that you have locks on your doors or a fast car that's not really going to protect you if they come right up on you. So, um, what do, what is people's reaction to a prey item? And and the thing is, it's it's not a perfect analogy because in the wild. When you have predators and prey, you know, lions, they don't have an option. They have to predate. I mean, sometimes they can scavenge, but they they have to kill to eat, to live. If they don't kill that buffalo, then they themselves are going to starve. And so you can, un, you, can you know, maybe not uh, blame the lions as much, but you certainly can't blame the buffalo for fighting back. But when we're talking about crime, you know, criminals are not facing starvation if they don't Uh, rob you if they don't kill you rape you whatever the case may be so to the extent that it's a disanalogy it's a disanalogy to the detriment of the argument that a human uh, victim should allow themselves to be defenseless and should not resist at all and they should just call the police and hope the police protect them um And again, this doesn't make a lot of sense. The idea being, if you believe in a representative democracy, which um, pretty much everybody on here, I mean, I mean, yes, libertarians don't. I don't believe in representative democracy, and most libertarians have quite a few qualifications of that. But if you're arguing for gun control in the context of the West, you're pretty much always going to be some kind of Democrat, right? Believe in democracy. Well, isn't the whole point that the population? delegates their powers to the uh to the state well if they don't if you don't have the right to defend yourself then that's not a power that you can delegate to the state right um right if you don't have the if you don't have the inherent right then you can't give the right to anybody else let alone the government um but practically speaking as we can see they're not going to be able to protect you and i think this is to a large extent, two things. Uh, one, just wishful thinking, right? A lot of people, and this is what one of the most alluring things about government is you can hypothetically think something or say something and then just assume that the state will do that. And if you don't have a really good understanding of the incentives that are involved, of the economic process that goes into dis- decision making, how bureaucracy works, how incentives work, um, how knowledge works, like the knowledge problem, like the, the state doesn't know who is likely to commit a crime and who's likely to be a victim of a crime. And even if they know, oh, this person's at a high risk, that doesn't mean they know that you're going to be mugged at 6.35 p.m. next Tuesday, right? So that knowledge is diffused with, with throughout society. Much of it is diffused in such a way that it can't be retrieved, right? We're not talking about if they had enough cameras, if they took enough surveys, if they tried to uh, create a massive surveillance state, which they're trying to do to some extent. Uh, and I would posit that, A, they'll never have that much. And even if they did, they would not be able to wield it in a way that would be effective for your personal case. Right? They would lack the knowledge of how to uh, intercede and so they don't they don't have the incentive you know their their point is that uh they get paid the same either way uh and they don't get punished if they don't do it and they can uh, mendaciously act like the heroes no matter what happens every outcome they're the good guy right doesn't matter if they completely fuck up doesn't matter if it's their fault doesn't matter if they exacerbate the situation um they can just come out to be the good guys. What's interesting in this last case is it's so egregious that they're not looking like the good guys, but they're still claiming that they are, and the court of law, which they control, right, there's this huge moral problem where the arbitration uh, association, the main one for criminal law, there is independent uh, there is independent arbitration out there for civil things, but not for criminal law, is run by the same organization, and so they have a huge incentive, and it's obviously not fair. Uh, you have moral hazard in the extreme because uh, the courts uh, work for the same company, work for the same institution uh, that runs the police. But, uh, yeah, they're not going to be able to protect you. And what's even worse in this case is that, you know, we have a, a, a gunman 
who gets his, uh, and people use that term gunman. You have this crazy guy. There was a lot of questions about this, by the way. I'm not going to get too ma- in too many specifics about this because uh, there's been already a lot of contradictory things said and retracted and gone back. Um, so there's, you know, and, and some of the details uh, don't illustrate much of a point. Others more. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much, but uh, there are questions how he afforded this weapon. I'm curious about that. He's 18. Doesn't seem like he has his shit together. I haven't heard that he has a job. Uh, I had heard that he asked uh, his sister to buy a weapon for her for him, and he she categorically said no. Uh, so this is a, a decent amount of money. The two guns that he had are both pretty nice. So we're looking at a few thousand dollars probably. Um, they say that he bought it at a store, so it wasn't stolen. Uh so I'm curious where he got the money. It is not impossible. I know 18-year-olds who've got $10,000 in the bank because they've worked for three years and they save all of it. This is That's highly unusual, and this guy doesn't seem like that kind of guy, especially if he's asking his, his sister to... And it's not like he's worried about going into debt if this was his plan all along. right? Who cares about your bills after you're dead, right? So I am quite curious about that. Uh, also the fact that he can't drive and he doesn't have a driver's license and he tried to drive there and he crashed his car apparently so uh, that would indicate to me that he was either so unhinged that he couldn't uh, manage a car or he literally cannot drive Um, so I'm not saying there were accomplices I'm not you know I don't know any of that Uh, some of these some of these school shootings are indeed extremely suspicious the 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 Columbine is just extremely suspicious if you look into it. There's a lot of stuff that was done to the crime scene after. There's lots of reports from people there, you know, witnessing uh, different activities. I don't want to get into that all now. If you can find it, there's a great, it's boring, but a great documentary called The Columbine Cause, which is basically somebody going through the the, the county report. You know, the county issued like a 25,000-page report. Um which included other things like students identifying other students besides Dylan, uh, Eric Harris, and Derek Klebold as shooters by name multiple times. Like multiple other students said, so-and-so was shooting people also. And there's pictures of this guy being led away by the cops, but ultimately he was never charged with anything. That's fascinating. And that, again, it's possible students, you know, they're in a stressful situation. They misremember things. They, you know, see somebody wearing black. They think that he's a shooter. Who knows? I, I'm not saying, but um, fascinating. Uh, the Las Vegas shooting also, that was completely memory hold. That's by far the worst shooting in U.S. history. That guy had spent at least hundreds of thousands of dollars on fully automatic, like, machine guns and had obviously had a lot of it seems like he had help. There's so many cameras in those hotels that how we don't have, you know, exact documentation of every single thing that he brought, when, why, and how. Like, and the fact that it wasn't even covered, like the news just forgot about it, even though it was much worse than any of these other shootings. Fascinating. So with this, I don't know if these questions are going to be answered. You know, the first two witnesses who saw him worked at apparently a barber shop. And they saw him retrieving guns out of the passenger car side of his crashed vehicle. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, was he riding the passenger side and someone else drove? Uh, or, you know, had he crashed and gotten out? Seems plausible. I don't know. Um, so you know, a lot of details here. But what we do know is that he goes into the school. The school already has a police officer there. So this isn't a case where they have to get on scene. They're already on scene. And within minutes... Four or five more police officers enter the scene. And before the rampage is done, at least 19 different police officers are in the building. And he's still alive and he's still killing people. And they're still getting 911 calls begging for them to help. And they're there and they're not helping. And on top of that, uh, some of the police went in and saved their own kids, apparently. Uh, This may come out to be false, but it's been reported a couple times and I haven't seen it. Uh, questioned at any point so okay they'll go and save their kids but then there were also lots of parents and other people who were piling up angry wanting to go in and the police were pepper spraying them tasing them and holding them back and saying you can't go and what is this saying this is saying they're not your kids it's not your decision they're our kids it's our decision and if we want to sit on our ass if we want to be cowards 
and go in there and not do anything, or maybe they weren't cowards, maybe they were just so incompetent that they didn't realize it was, I mean, this is what I've most recently heard, is they thought that it wasn't an active shooter situation anymore. I don't know why they would have thought that. They certainly hadn't killed the gunman. Did the gunman just tell them, oh, I'm not going to kill anyone anymore? And they were like, oh, okay, yeah, so we'll just let you stay in the room with all the kids until, you know, until what? So I'd love to hear their uh, excuses for all this, but the bottom line is the entire point is that they own you. They own your kids, and they own you, and they get to decide who gets defended and who doesn't. They want to save their kids, they can. They don't want you to save your kids, you can't. And they'll tase you, and they'll probably charge you with a crime, too. And this is what gets me passionate about it, is that they're so incredibly mendacious that they will completely fuck up in every way. This whole time, they tell us, we protect and serve. Every time you get pulled over for speeding, right, you're going 45 and a 35 uh, in the middle of the night, and... You see the lights and this jackbooted, you know, paramilitary uniformed officer comes up and they have this cocky attitude like uh, they're God's gift to the world and that they're the ones in control and they're the ones with the power and you need to be deferential to them because they're the authority and they're the they're the good guys and they they have the righteous might of the state behind them, you know, and they're going to say ultimately oh, well, legally I can do all this and I can feel this way, sure. But also, you should because I'm the one who will defend you. I'm the one, like, if you need help, it's going to be me. And so you're like, you're doing me a solid, like, you you just kind of, like, owe it to me, right? Like your friend, if you had a friend who saved your life, right, like literally saved your life, you know, you might understand if that friend felt entitled to some, um, some, like that you, you owe them, that you that you felt maybe some obligation. You had the Chewbacca life debt because their friend saved you. And, the, you know, a cop hasn't saved you. They probably haven't saved anybody. But they still want you to act because it's on the potential that someday they might save you. And then when the day comes and you actually need their help or need somebody to do something, not only do they not do it, they stop anyone else from helping. As if... Sure, people who ran in, they they would have been in danger. They could have been killed. Uh, but isn't it that their right to take that risk, to make that calculation and say, I know I could die, but I'm going to go in there and and stop this person however I can. And it's Texas. There's guns around. People have them, right? It was over an hour that he was in the school. They had 911 was alerted before he even got to the school. And you've got these 20 officers... 19 excuse me only 19 and then I don't know were they just afraid were they just incompetent does it even matter which of the two you know and I and I do actually think you know police force is big and diverse there are people in the police force who are absolutely I I mean you could say it it's courageous you could say it's rabid you could you could say it in in a derogatory way but there there are people in, in the police force who are absolutely aggressive and absolutely I I don't doubt for one second would have gone in their guns blazing and these are the but these people aren't you know they're not your meter maids they're not the cops who are going out on patrol and giving tickets these are guys who gravitate to things like SWAT teams because they really want to go and get their adrenaline rush and you know I'm not saying it's good either because that ends up meaning they kill they kill puppies they kill grandmas they bust things up you know and it's funny that they'll they have all this wherewithal and this willingness and this even this eagerness to do no-knock raids in the middle of the night on people who have no evidence against them or flimsy em- evidence against them. And, you know, they don't kill people every time. And, and actually, they, they work very hard to hide not only how many people they kill, but how many bullets they even fire. Uh, there's a website out there called Puppy Side that just tries to track the numbers of dogs that they kill, right? But that's not most police. Most police are just... Um, on average, lower intelligence, on average, lower height. And a lot of them harbor a lot of insecurities. And they can paper over those with a badge. And they get all this legal validation and all of this social validation, which has started to change in recent years. You know, one of the one of the few, maybe only good things of like the Black Lives Matter, uh, 
matter movement is that it's kind of besmirched the police in stupid ways for the wrong reasons, right? Like saying that they're all racist, which is probably rarely, if ever, true. Um, they could, could and should be besmirched for a whole host of real reasons, not that they're racist because the overwhelming majority of them are not. And even the ones who are know that that's the one line that they have to be very careful about crossing. But they can be complete cowards. This fear and vaunting. On the one hand, we're the best. We're going to serve and protect. Yeah, to serve and protect the mass shooter as he kills your kids. And then they're going to tase you when you try and go in. And there's another element to this, too. So this Uvalde Police Department, like most or all police departments in the country, has received lots and lots, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in federal grant money to uparm, to have body armor, to have uh, you know SWAT vehicles, to get training, and they're certified. They're certified for hostage rescue and all that. And in fact, just recently they had done drills. There's pictures of them all posing. And you know, I mean, just to kind of go on a, on, a, on another side tangent, that money was obviously all wasted in this town, at least, right? They got all they, they we spent the, whatever penny, however much, the, and I don't know the number. I w- it would surprise me if it wasn't at least in the low millions of grant money that was given to them. Never mind tax money that's in their regular budget. Um, what did that buy you at the end? It bought you nothing. They just let the shooter go uh, and stopped citizens from intervening. And this, by the way, always happens. Uh, so I'm no fan of David Hogg. David Hogg is a is a fame seeking dipshit who was live streaming at Parkland when he was in high school, blaming the NRA while he was still in lockdown in his classroom. That that fucking piece of shit jumped up in front of the cameras every single day. You know, Parkland had hundreds of students. You saw the same four fucking students on every single thing. But I would encourage people to go and listen to David uh David Hogg's interview with uh, 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 Coleman. Uh, uh, what's his name? Ron Coleman? No, not Ron Coleman. Um, Coleman Hughes. Excuse me. Coleman Hughes. Um, at some point in the conversation, Coleman asks, well, what about... And, and Hogg demonstrates his ignorance throughout the thing, saying he doesn't know the difference between a semi-automatic and a fully automatic. Bro, is this not your thing? Is this not what made you famous and what you have uh, coasted your entire you know, career, at least as far as your media presence and your, your fame or infamy, however you want to say, is based, and you never could bother to look up the difference between semi on But whatever, Coleman asked him about resource officers, about police officers who are stationed in school. And Hogg was just completely indignant. And you could tell he was outraged. Like, And, and it, it makes sense because this is outrage that doesn't really advances point, so I almost think it's more likely to be genuine because there was a resource officer at Parkland. He was there when the shooting happened, and he didn't do anything about it. And he didn't add, but like, it was very soon. There were four more officers who arrived. They never went in. And it wasn't until, like I think, like 20 minutes about later that a much larger force of officers came from a different municipality from a different town, they did go in. By the time they did, the shooter had left, and he got arrested, I think, at Subway after the fact. But uh, that wasn't Hogg's point. His po- Hogg's point was the resource officer was fired. He was fired because he didn't protect the students, right? You have a police officer at the school that the taxpayers are paying for, and he walks around the school with his gun and his badge, uh, acting like a tough guy threatening kids with life in prison because they sent nudes to their girlfriend. I'm not even kidding. That's the most, mostly what they do. Oh, you're 17 and you sent nudes to your 17 year old girlfriend. You're, you're a pedophile. You're that's child porn. You better stop that or else. Um, but then when the shooter shows up, they don't do anything. He got fired and then he sued and argued in court that, his job did not obligate him to intercede. His uh, his job didn't obligate him to protect anyone. And guess what? The court agreed and made the police department reinstate him in his job. And this isn't a surprise to anybody who knows the legal precedents here because ultimately the Supreme Court has said over and over and over again in so many cases that the police have zero obligation to protect you. Now, they do have an obligation to protect you if you're in prison. Okay, if you're in prison, 
they have some obligate some obligation to protect you. They're in some way responsible. And this is how you can get prisoners suing them because, you know, they weren't given proper medical treatment. They, they didn't pay for their trans surgery. They didn't give them. I remember John Stossel interviewing one who was suing because he didn't like the food and they didn't give him a, the right kind of food. And I think he wanted crunchy peanut butter and they didn't give it to him. And he was suing for a million dollars. OK, but in terms of defending people who aren't incarcerated, zero, they have zero obligation. So what's the incentive? They don't, they're not going to do it. And, and like, I'm sure there are some out there who might, but these incidents are so rare that they're not going to be there. The incentives are against it. At the end of the day, they know they're going to get protected. The worst thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some, some media backlash. They might lose their job or get transferred or put on administrative leave. Maybe, which that's not a big, uh, you know, detriment to someone versus like maybe getting killed or, you go in there and you kill other students, which that's also happened. I think uh, if you look, this wasn't a school shooting, but the Pulse mass shooting. So the the Afghanistan immigrant guy who took over a gay club. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that a lot, maybe even the majority of the victims, quote unquote, weren't killed by him. They were killed by the SWAT team that came barging in. That he killed a few people. So yes, mass murder, horrible person, bad situation, kills a few. Then there is a hostage situation. They do a dynamic entry and they kill him and they shoot up, you know, more people. And there was a lot about the coroner report, you know, to indicate because they use different types of rounds, different types of guns. So it was easy to see who was shot by who. And it's kind of like, well, <clears throat> you might have three members of that SWAT team who have commit, committed multiple homicides. Um, now, ethically, hey, where they're trying to stop a shooter, it's the shooter's fault. Get that you know that does actually that is a legitimate complication there but i don't know i mean at jo governor abbott said hey i know people are angry but this could have been a lot worse if the police weren't there i don't see how because the townspeople would have mobbed in there apparently they were trying to and the police were stopping they there were two, there are two things people weren't because they think this police are going to protect them right this is the moral hazard part of it where you don't take the steps that you need because you think the police are going to protect you. That's stupid. It's the same people who think, it's the same, it's same as people think, I don't need to save. I don't need to invest. I don't have to make provisions for the future because I'll get Social Security. Yeah, wow. Now, that's stupid. It's short-sighted. But there's at least a much higher likelihood that you will receive something in Social Security. You'll get something in the mail. It may be inflated and not be worth very much, and the purchasing power won't keep up, and it will be pennies on the dollars what you paid, that you'll get something. But the odds that the police are going to literally intercede to protect you are so infinite, infinitesimally small that it's um, fantasy. It's fantasy to think that they will. Uh, and in this case, you have both people who maybe aren't intervening because they, hey, the police have got it. But then you also have people who are trying to intervene, trying to go and get their kids. I don't know how many people were going in there with the intent of stopping the shooter, maybe some, and the police were actively preventing this, actively um, stopping the shooter from being stopped. Bad way to word it, but still, you see the point. And they're going to walk away. We're the heroes. You need us. And by the way, we're going to take your guns now. That's what, that's what people are going to say. Uh, I think the problem is this is so obviously a case like, well, if we're not, if we can't defend ourselves, who's going to defend us? The police? Obviously, they're not. Right. And statistics, statistically, they're not. This idea that police are heroes that jump in and stop a crime at the last second um, is complete Hollywood fantasy. I don't know if there was some, uh, you know, Project Mockingbird CIA program to you know, infiltrate the movie and TV industry and have, let's have every other protagonist be some kind of law enforcement and have every plot revolve around them solving a crime and in the final scene, jumping in to stop a murder or a homicide or whatever. That, that is, that's about as common as Bigfoot. All right. It just never really happens. You can see hints of it there and there, but it never really happens. Um, and yet people, when they talk about policy, kind of pretend like that's what's going to happen. It's, again, so common with government is people are able to project some kind of imaginary reality um, that 
very often is either hypothetically impossible or even theoretically impossible, but they are going to base their policy um, 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 preferences on that, right? They're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, universal health care will be, everyone will get the best health care ever. There'll be no cost cutting. There'll be no death boards. There'll be, you know, everything will be better in every way. Everything will be quote unquote free. Everything will be free. And so therefore I, I favor universal health care. None of that's true. None of that can ever happen. But it sounds good, so you advocate. Well, the idea that the police are going to protect you is no. So what are what are we going to do? You know, what what policy are we talking about? This guy bought it legally. He didn't buy it at a gun show. Uh, you're not going to be able to ban. I mean, AR-15s. A, it wouldn't matter. You just use something that's not an AR-15. But there's so many of them out there. The idea that you're going to turn them all in, and and people use them in self-defense too. Uh, and that's the another crazy thing. And there's so many things about the gun control and. Uh, I don't want to telescope all of them off of this one incident, but this idea that like, oh, they could never, well, so, you know, you have a right to life. You have a right to defend your life, right? If someone attacks you, you don't have a duty to just sit there. There was a famous case of a guy, I think in San Diego, who owned a business. I think he owned like a watch shop. You can see interviews of this guy. And it was a high crime area and one of his one of the other business owners said you should have a gun and gave him a gun and like a week later he got attempted robbed he killed the guy um and then he realized that he got lucky because he wasn't really trained so he started training 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 hiding guns all over his place and he ended up killing like three more criminals um basically because he killed one like their friends decided okay we're going to take revenge which ended up being the wrong thing to do because he killed both of them too and he was uh, eventually awarded a concealed carry permit, uh, which I think he was like the only or maybe one of two people in that entire county that were awarded them. Because in California, it's a, a discretionary issue, and discretionary means non-issue in many places. Um, but there's an interview he gives. I, I, sh- I should look up his name. If someone can figure out this guy's name, put it in the comments. Um, this is years ago that I watched this interview with him. But he said, I acknowledge that many criminals are not going to want to kill me they're not thinking that's their plan they probably just want to rob me or or something else but i don't know and i'm not going to surrender my autonomy and put all of the decision put all put my faith in their hands they've already by trying to mug me by trying to rob me by by threatening me even if they don't have a weapon but even more so if they do they've shown that they are aggressive that they have ill intent that their ethics permit them to do uh to do wrong and the idea that i should simply sit on my hands and just accept what they give me is asinine and i get this a lot you know people like look they're just gonna rob you just why do you gotta shoot them like you don't know that that's not what they're gonna do they could murder you they could harm you they could rape you they could do all manner of things you're not obligated to be their victim right uh and that means that you should be able to own a gun and on top of that in some contexts, in some countries, you know, the most likely thing that you're going to face is common criminals. But it's also possible that you could face a state. You know, a state could threaten you. And states do threaten people, your own state or other states. You know, this happened uh, in February when Russia invaded Ukraine. What is one of the first things the Ukrainian parliament did when they reconvened? Uh, they legalized gun ownership in a, in, a, in a substantive way that it hadn't been before. Why? Because they want their citizens to be able to shoot and and fight right and it's a little late at that point because you haven't armed your populace and they're not uh used to guns but like hey people never thought that could happen and yet here it has happened it's less likely in the united states the united states is going to get invaded the united states is geopolitically in this sweet spot that's like perfect uh makes that very unlikely but it still could happen but there could still be violence from our state, our state is still violent and repressive at times and can be deadly and can kill people. Uh, and gun controllers have this really weird, um, incoherent, contradictory opinion that if you bring up uh, defending yourself against the state, they'll say, oh, well, AR-15 isn't going to do anything against the military. And it's like, well, that's... A, not true. Uh, you know, a 10 million people armed with AR-15s is a problem for the state, right? They can't just wave, hand wave that away. As, as Boston Tea Party said about the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, 60,000 dead Russians can't be wrong. They weren't 
those 60,000 Russians weren't killed by artillery or tanks or, you know, the Afghans didn't have a single helicopter or a single plane, and no missiles. They were mostly killed with small arms, and most of those small arms weren't even AK-47s. They were World War One and World War Two era uh, bolt-action rifles that there had just been a large supply of in Afghanistan. Um, but if... So that that's just wrong. Also... It's not an argument for banning guns altogether. It's an argument for just legalizing more weapons. Uh, uh, it's just an argument to say, okay, yeah, maybe maybe it is a problem that we don't have our own drones and tanks and whatever else, so maybe we should legalize those. I don't know how many people would own them, how many people would be able to operate these crew-operated weapons. It's like who's going to have the, the, the funds to, available to to keep them up? You know, Not many, but hey. But then the other problem is, then something like this happens, and then they say, oh, the AR-15 is a weapon of war. It's so powerful. It's so incredible. Um, the police all cowered in fear, and it's understandable. They were outgunned. The police had no no chance against an AR-15. So, of course, they didn't go in, and and they can kill they can kill 20 people. Uh, and, well, first of all, if you, if you prevent other people from interceding, if you give the killer an hour in a closed in space, he doesn't need an AR-15. He could use a fucking muzzleloader to kill 20 people. You know, even the slowest muzzleloaders take a minute to reload. So he has two of them. He's got one that's loaded, fires one, kills one person. He's got the other one as a backup in case people charge him, loads the other one. 20 minutes, he's killed 20 people. You don't need an AR-15 if the police are going to run interference for you, which they did in this case, whether that was their intention or not. I mean, I'm assuming it wasn't their intention, like, but, you know, but, uh, yeah, you don't, now all of a sudden AR-15 is a weapon of war that's too powerful. So, like, when they want to ban it, it's, it's too powerful, it's the most terrible thing ever, it's a weapon of war, it belongs on a battlefield, fully automatic, death ray. But then if you say, well, but we could use them to defend ourselves against the state, like, no, no, it would never work, it would be, it would be, the aircraft carrier would just run over you. Right, yeah, they would just hydrogen bomb you. They would just shoot atomic bombs and blow up every city in the country to stop the people who have AR-15s, right? They're going to target every AR-15 with a hydrogen bomb. Yeah, okay. So, uh, I don't think this is going to lead to anything. I really don't, because it's, the cat is out of the bag. You know, we've lost on so many issues. Uh, our rights have been eroded in so many ways. But the Constitution did one good thing. The Constitution is, in many ways, just a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper a lot of people believe in, and some and some parts more than others. And, you know, I mean, the First Amendment's actually lost a lot of its stalwarts. You know, the ACLU has become very not First Amendment at this point. You know, what, what, whatever happened to defending neo-Nazis in Skokie, now they're talking about banning books that are transphobic. But Second Amendment also had its advocates, and it has millions of them, and they're organized, and they get their story out there, and they've been very effective, at least at the national level and in many cases at the state level, at either uh, stopping gun control or even repealing stuff that had gotten passed earlier. It's, it does seem like there wasn't that much of an active gun rights movement mid-20th century, and it wasn't until the late 20th century that it started to really pick up steam, and now it has. There's been a revolution when it comes to things like concealed carry, constitutional carry in this country. Just in my life, it's changed radically in most of the country, and it's continuing to do that. Those trends are all in the right direction. The federal government has been completely stalled. They, they'll do. Biden will do. I mean, Biden's such a weirdo. He's said stuff like, you can't just use a shotgun. You know, like, um, <laughs> Just uh, he, I think Biden said that you should threaten someone with a shotgun if you think that they might be a problem. Like he, like he advocated committing a crime. Uh, just, I mean, Biden's hilarious because he just says what comes into his head. And this even before he had dementia, he was like that. If, if you have ever never watched the interview between Jan Helfeld and Joe Biden from ten fifteen years ago, absolutely go watch it. It's hilarious. But, um, uh. Yeah, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Texas, Texas is not going to pass gun control because of this. Um, and if people say, hey, we should do something, yeah, we should just abolish public schools. They shouldn't exist at all. They don't. There is no Second Amendment for public schools. They have no constitutional reason to exist. They're victim disarmament zones. You know, these people, if you want to kill a bunch of people, if you want to gain infamy, you don't go to a gun show. You don't go to a sport. You don't go to a Bass Pro Shop. You don't go to someplace where they might have guns. Or, or you don't even go to Walmart because... In most states, there's enough concealed carry. There's a couple hundred people in Walmart. There's a couple people with handguns in there. You're going to get killed. You're not going to have such a huge death toll. But 
schools don't don't even allow their teachers who are registered to carry concealed in almost every state. I think there's like Utah is like the one state that doesn't, and you don't ever hear about school shootings in Utah, right? I mean, they're low. Then that I mean, again, fascinating debate. These are black swan events. They're so incredibly rare. I I, I believe, you know, people like always like to cite Australia. First of all, Australia's crime, violent crime, gun homicide, total homicide started declining in 1988. They passed their gun control that everyone's, you know, infamously aware of, I think in 97, 98, so eight to 10 years later. And actually the crime declined at the same rate uh, in the United States over the same period without any gun control, really. So it's clearly not, I mean, it's an interesting question. Well, what caused it to go down? Clearly not the gun control law because it went down before the gun control law. I mean, this is where, I mean, the gun control advocates think they've got a, a just a, I mean, and look, there are ethical and moral reasons. I don't even care. I'm for gun rights regardless. Even if you could demonstrate that we had twice the murder rate because I'd say it's fine. I don't care. It's your right. I'm going to live with it. But in point of fact, the evidence that there's a correlation between gun ownership and gun homicide is is nil now there is a good relationship with gun violence and if you ever hear that term gun violence think in your brain wow that's an awfully generic term that does not that that is a term designed to confuse because it it includes yes homicides and accidents also includes suicides which are just ethically completely different and it's not just like oh there's a couple suicides no two-thirds of the quote-unquote gun violence are suicides who, but why should we have guns banned because some people kill themselves? Like, like I know one person, like one person who's been killed by a gun. He was a year younger than me in my high school. He played hockey, really athletic, really nice guy, great guy. Got married very young. I think he got married like as soon as he graduated high school. Lovely young wife who I also knew. And uh, he then he got brain cancer. And it wasn't a case where they didn't have health care. They had the best health care you could have. They had chemo, everything. Fought it, fought it, fought it, fought it for a long time and lost. And, you know, got to the point where he was degrading more and more. They they exhausted all the options, and that's basically you're going to die. So guess what? He decided he didn't want to wait for it, and he blew his brains out. He killed himself. Okay, that's that's tragic. That's awful. What does that have to do? Why, why should his death, that statistic, be included in a number to then say, we got to ban guns and you shouldn't be able to have AR-15s? As tragic as that is, what does that have to do with homicide? Nothing. So yes, if you ban and restrict guns, the no- total number of gun deaths will go down because they won't be used in suicide nearly as much because they won't be available. The suicide rate doesn't actually go down. People just suicide other ways. You know, Japan has almost no gun deaths. And they have an absurd suicide rate, as does China, by the way. China and Japan both have really high suicide rates that dwarf the United States. The number of people who are killing themselves there is just way bigger per capita than it is in the United States. They're just not using guns, but who cares? Oh, wow. Like, oh, no, my, you know, my best friend killed himself. Like, did he, did he shoot himself? No, he slit his wrists and bled out. Oh, okay, that's fine. No big deal. Like, as long as he didn't shoot himself in the head, like, I mean, if anything, it's easier, like, like maybe messier, but also quicker. I don't know. Like, so, uh, yeah, but even in countries like Australia, th- their big problem is they will pick a country, especially Australia, but also the UK, and be like, look, they have all these restrictions, and they have gun restrictions, and they have low homicide. Yes, but they had low, low homicide before they had gun restrictions. I have a whole video. Go way back to 2011. U.S. versus U.K. gun control. I uploaded all that, it's, and it's still true today. That they always, the U.K. in its entire history has had three mass shootings. Three, two of them happened before the ban, and one of them in 2008 in Cumbria happened. Right. So, those are what Nassim Talib would call a black swan events. They're so rare that you can't draw any statistical conclusions. And similar to Australia, mass shootings were very rare. They have actually. Had, they they passed the bans in ninety again I want to say ninety seven ninety eight you know could be ninety six but you know you get late nineties um, they they actually had a, uh, a mass shooting I think a year or two ago it was like four people they did have a few before that but it was such a low rate we're talking about maybe one a year 
that's too low to draw any conclusions from. The other thing is I don't believe they ever had a school shooting, ever. So it's just not a, th- like, there's just cultural, there. I, I, I have news, like, the United States is different. We have a different culture, uh, and people express that in a different way. But, you know, in terms of mass shootings, it's not even the case that the United States has the most per capita of quote-unquote Western countries. They happen in Scandinavia. They happen in Germany. You know, Norway's way up on the list because they, they've they had a couple, but they had one that was such a high um, casualty event that it's just skewed the numbers. But, like, it's a small country, right? That's 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 <laughs> You only have 5 million people, and one of them— goes and shoots 67 people i believe by the way he's like already out of prison or whatever or on probation or something you kill 67 people and you're on probation what the hell no wonder they're gonna have another mass shooting probably so yeah the argument i mean i the utilitarian arguments would not sway me but the truth is they're not persuasive anyway and i i you can't get i cannot get people to engage with this I can't tell you, I mean, you know, I'm gay. I know a lot of Australian gay guys. I mean, there's good reasons to like Australian gay guys. But even the libertarian ones tend to be strongly anti-gun, more so than even like the British libertarians. British libertarians seem to be much more cool on this than Australians. I don't know why that is. There's there's obviously something that's different. Uh, but you can show them the graph and you can say, look, here's the homicide rate in Australia. It starts to It starts to tank in 1988. So how is that? How is a gun control bill that's passed in '98, ten years later, or maybe eight years later, or even one year later, though, would ruin the argument? But we're like, not we're we're an order of magnitude further than that. They have nothing. And I one guy said, "Well, it's the you know the 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 government program says it's to protect us, so maybe okay, but just be so it's the Patriot Act is really patriotic, right? If the government says that it's for something, then that's what it does. Come on. So yeah, it's absolutely infuriating. Uh, uh, none of it, ma- none of it stands up to any scrutiny. It's really frustrating, which is why I made 30 videos about it or 20 videos about it way back. Why well, I continue to make videos about it. The police can't protect you. They won't protect you. You're a fool if you think that they will. Uh, you're a fool if you think gun control. I mean, in the context of the United States, it's such an asinine discussion. Uh, we can 3D print guns. They can be manufactured. People know how to make them. Not most people, but enough people that there's going to be a demand. There's going to be a market. They can't stop drugs. They're not going to stop guns. Uh, and um, it's just going to... Re- and, you know, uh, major restrictions will make it harder for criminals, but they'll make it impossibly hard for law-abiding people. Law-abiding people will, you know, turn them in at a much higher rate. Uh, and so, relatively speaking, the uh, innocent people or the law-abiding people will become disarmed relative to the criminals. That's not going to be good. Even if even if the number of guns the criminals have gets cut by half, oh, that's great, right? But if the number of guns held by private people gets cut 80%, n- now, you know, private... Um, you know, law-abiding people are uh, disproportionately disarmed. So, no, that's not good. That's bad, right? You've made it worse. And also, like, these things don't... They tried to do a AR-15 ban in Connecticut, and I think they had, like, less than 10% compliance. It was completely, like... And this Connecticut. Connecticut. People were just, nope, not doing it. It's not happening. This is not happening. Like, this is... This is just one of those things. It's not happening. Just give up. It's a losing issue. You know, Democrats, you've got five dollars a gallon gas. You don't want to be pissing off the NRA at this time. So, um, anyway, I think I've talked long enough on this. Let me know what you guys think. If anyone hears any other rumors or stories about what happened, I'd love to hear. But otherwise, have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>